the Avatar live action recently came out on Netflix, and there's been many different opinions about it, mostly negative. Before I inevitably watch the live action in the near future, I have something to admit about the original series. I have never seen this show before. I should not have said that. I know, it's a crime against humanity. How have I never seen one of the best animated shows ever made? This might anger every Avatar fan, but my first introduction to the show was indeed through M. Night Shyamalan's live-action adaptation. But don't worry, because like many people, I did not enjoy it in the absolute slightest. My name is Ong. And I'm the Avatar. <laughs> I just had to check this out because people were preaching about how much they love this original show. For something so popular, I thought it would be an interesting idea to give my initial thoughts on a franchise as an outside adjudicator. No nostalgia involved. So after 17 years, I finally sat down and watched Avatar The Last Airbender. It was interesting jumping into a story which was first made in 2007, albeit it was an amazing year for animation, but when you watch something that was done from the past, you have to watch it in the context of the time period. Whether that be thematic differences, technical limitations. So when I started Water, which is book one of the series, the first thing that came to my mind was, does this animation live up to the modern standards of animation? And the answer is no. No, absolutely not. <laughs> it's better. I was absolutely gobsmacked with the level of nuance and detail in the animation. From the smallest motions, it's actually insane how overexpressive these characters are. And I have said many times on this channel that animation is embellishment, it is over-exaggerating what your characters are doing, because you have the ability to do so, and that means you can amplify the story. What blew me away was the fight choreography, the bending choreography, because it took me back to like old school kung fu sets and even like tai chi from the water bending stuff because it's a lot more flowy. For context, I used to do this type of martial arts in the past, you know, things like kung fu, taekwondo. It was really cool seeing Ang do earth bending. It just took me back because he goes into horse dance and I'm like, oh, I've done that a lot of times. <laughs> Some of the expressions alone were enough to make me just burst out laughing. Like it'll be a normal conversation and then someone will just pull the most outrageous face. It just it takes you off guard because of the fluidity of that animation. It was just so impressive and that type of thing needs to be pushed. It needs to be done more in modern animation because I was blown away. I think when a lot of people talk about how powerful Avatar is as a show, usually they're alluding to the writing of the series and how well the thematics and kind of political and tonal elements are displayed throughout the show. Not always in expositional dialogue either, but through the visuals or even sound design. I think I realised when I got to about book two-ish, like the Earth chapter, you have to consider that when you're animating and writing a show, you have to make it to encapsulate everyone because anyone might watch it. People might say it's aimed at children, it's aimed at kids, and there are a lot of child-friendly factors. I mean, the humour is quite kiddie, the characters themselves are children, so it makes plenty of sense, but anyone can watch this show anyone can appreciate the depth in this writing and i think that was something that kind of touched me i just don't think enough people realize how much skill it takes to create a show which pulls in all types of audiences from younger to older all for different reasons maybe younger for the entertaining elements of the story and the older for the underlying thematics. And of course, the action and the entertaining elements are still amazing to adults, so let's not just throw that in the bin, but there's so much more to it. For a lot of people, there could be like one reason they enjoy this show, and that could be strictly down to Uncle Iroh. <laughs> Uncle Iroh is one of the best characters I have ever seen. I love him to bits, and I think I get why everyone loves him too. <laughs> He's just this wholesome ball of cuddliness and light which kind of illuminates and brings hope to the Fire Nation. <laughs> Alongside Zuko, who's 
Redemption arc is fantastic. I love the whole dynamic of the Fire Nation monarchy. I think it works really well to set up the different characters and their motivations. And even the timeline works really well because you see the Fire Nation's rise to power and Aang's kind of connection to Zuko. As time goes along, the more Zuko learns about what he should prioritize in his life. Is it his family or is it doing the right thing, which is what's taught to him by your boy, Uncle Iroh. Zuko is grasping at straws for near enough the whole time, he's initially displayed as this force to be reckoned with, and to his respect he is. But when Azula arrives, it's really shown how broken he is as a person. How desperate he is chasing after something he'll never get, being his dad's admiration. This reminds me of another character I know with a burn on their face and daddy issues. Yeah, funny that. What makes the companionship of Team Avatar so good is how vastly different everyone is. It takes a hot minute for people to actually get used to one another. And that's what happens in the real world. There's conflicting ideologies across the board. Complicated characters are just way more interesting. Okay, that's just how it is. Better than boring slabs of nothingness, who also weren't even the correct ethnicity. And if we're going to talk about writing strong female characters, Katara is amazing, and the best part is she doesn't have to say she is. Suki is an incredible character. She doesn't have to say she is. None of these characters are written in such a way in which they have to be typecasted or have to prove themselves to the audience or tick off some kind of criteria. They are just good and serve the story in the best way possible. And even the sequel, Legend of Korra, has a girl as a protagonist. I haven't seen Korra yet. That's gonna be another video because I know that's completely different, so I can't wait for that. There isn't a single character in the series I disliked because everyone, even the most random side characters, have so much personality and so much humor and charm. And I was just like taken aback by how little of this we have nowadays. It's actually insane. I just didn't expect any of this to happen, but the comedy is amazing. And another testament to how well this show is just written and paced. It kind of balances so many different emotions. Of course, it's all these strengths and insecurities of these characters that make them more powerful as a unit. And you see Team Avatar build over time, like over the duration of the seasons. And it's like, you kind of, you, you do, I know it sounds kind of pathetic, but you do grow with them, don't you? Like you just do. I think what's interesting and a genuinely new take I might be able to bring to this topic, because obviously so many people have seen Avatar now, but I think a lot of people are sort of, their eyes are clouded over by nostalgia. Some things might seem way better because you experienced them in your childhood and you don't want to really let that break apart. You know, it's always going to be there. Basically what I'm saying is a lot of the time nostalgia can cloud people's judgment of a series. So when I watched this, I wasn't looking through some like rose tinted glasses. I wasn't looking through nostalgia. I was just seeing a show for as it is. And I get it. Nostalgia there or not, it's such a well-written show. Now, there are some problems, okay? There's problems with everything we watch in our lives. For Avatar, for me, there was just some unnecessary episodes. There was a lot of filler here and there. There was one specific episode, and I'm gonna find it. <laughs> What's the name of it? This is like fresh after watching this show, by the way. I'm just like venting my thoughts, so I'll find the episode. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> the Great Divide. <laughs> What a weird... <laughs> there were some things that are so unnecessary. I found that one so funny. But by the end of the episode, Aang is just as fed up as the audience is. So he just lies to these two conflicting tribes to get them to make up with one another. <laughs> it's so unnecessary. <laughs> There's a couple of weird episodes that just don't really add anything to the story. But regardless, they're cute. Okay, they, they are cute. I'm not going to be mad about filler. I, I know people were like, oh, I can't be asked for filler. But if you don't like filler, you can just skip it anyway. Okay, it's not that deep. Filler has been a thing forever. So when it comes to the nostalgia aspect, I think just scrap that. Throw it in the bin. Okay, people are going to be like, oh, you just like this show because of nostalgia. I just experienced it. And I can 100% stay this show is timeless. It has timeless qualities. It has qualities that allow it to survive thanks to its characters, thanks to its themes, thanks to its messaging and politics. Every element of this show, see why I did that? <laughs> it comes together literally and you can just tie it off with a bow because it has everything 
you could ever want from a show. That's what attracted me to this show because everyone is so passionate about how well it survives. This is one of the best shows I've watched in a really long time and the crazy part is how long it's been there available to me to watch and I just never got around to it. Anyway, that was my experience. It was a wild one and I absolutely loved it. I cannot wait to watch Korra. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you are new and take care.